Right. A lot, a lot more to, to learn. Um, epigenetic age reversal. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big interest, of course. Um, and uh, there's been, I'm sort of curious about your, your recent, like some of your thoughts on some of the, there's been some recent studies. So we were talking about programming, mm -hmm. right? We were talking about, in a, in a way, right? With, with the developmental program and mm -hmm. this epigenetic clock sort of really tracking that yeah. really well being part of that in some way connected. We don't really, I don't exactly understand yeah. Stan Meyer, I don't know if, if it's known, but. I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> okay, so um, some of this work with interrupted cellular reprogramming or the, the partial reprogramming mm -hmm. as it's called, a lot of that work's come from uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte's group mm -hmm. where they can, um, they can it, maybe you can explain like yeah. what this is to people and um, how that affects epigenetic aging or what's known or not known. But, yeah. So this really came out of um, work originally from Shinya Yamanaka, who discovered what we call these Yamanaka factors, which are four transcription factors. We just call them OSKM, um, which, when expressed, you can actually take a somatic, so a, an adult cell, and convert it back into what looks like an embryonic stem cell. So we call these induced pluripotent stem cells. And then you can use those to make a number of different types of cells. But the interesting thing and why aging researchers got really invested in this science is that not only are you making it embryonic-like in terms of its stem cell properties, but the epigenetic clocks are, seem to be almost completely reversed. And we've actually shown recently they're not completely reversed, but you can take a skin cell that has an epigenetic age of 40 and do this, it takes, you know, a a few weeks to do and, and basically get back to an epigenetic age of zero in those cells. And, and, and you keep it at the skin cell? It doesn't lose its identity? No, so it loses its identity. Okay, when you, when in, you yeah, so this full, um, this is considered kind of this full epigenetic reprogramming. And then what Juan Carlos Belmonte and others have done is look at this idea of partial reprogramming. So can we push the cell back a little bit? Because actually what we find is that this age reversal happens first, prior to the cell losing its identity. So can you do that part without pushing it all the way back, what we consider up or down the landscape, to this, this pluripotent stem cell? So can I just make an old skin cell a young skin cell, but it's still a skin cell? So that's the goal. Right. And, and with um, some of the recent work, at least out of his lab, um, they're using a premature aging mass model, a progeria model, and have shown, I know there's a new publication I haven't read, just came out, but yeah. the older one, the, fir the first one, 2016 or something, mm -hmm. um, cell paper, I remember, they, they, they showed in, in multiple different organs, it seemed to, to reverse some of the hallmarks of aging, mm -hmm. you know, and the organs were performing functionally a little bit, you know, yeah. younger than you would imagine, and at least in this premature aging mo mouse model, and I think even health span of, mm -hmm. of this mouse model that's prematurely aging, it seemed to be improved. I mean, what that means for humans that are not mice with yeah. prematuring aging syndromes yeah. was to be determined, but, um, but the epigenetic clock also was, was also reversed as well, right? In, yeah, in and that. I think the new publication, which is done in more of a wild type, not a progerioid mice, mouse does show kind of some reversal of the epigenetic clock. And, and you can do this just cells in a dish. We can partially reprogram them and show reversal of epigenetic clock. Um, and other functional improvements in the cells. So to you, what does that mean, like, that you can do that? Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I think this is the most fascinating thing. Again, I don't know in terms of translation, like actually making this a therapeutic, and I don't even think people were at the point where we're science. speculating. But yeah, I just think it's so amazing. I mean, even the original thing that you can take, a, you know, a skin cell and turn it into an embryonic stem cell, and just, we always think of, you know, this time, zero, like this is one direction cells are going to only move, you know, what we consider this landscape in terms of their states, and they can only go from this state to that state. The idea that it can go back, I think, is amazing. And I think just understanding how that process works. And then the other thing we're really interested in is what are the features of this programmed cell? Like, does it truly look like a young cell, or is it a totally different type of cell that in nature maybe we haven't even seen and what does that mean for how it's going to function and totally. respond? The yeah. questions I have in my mind are, okay, well, 
you take this, you know, 40-year-old skin cell, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and let's say you're going to completely reprogram it to a stem cell, and your epigenetic age goes back, um, but, like, what happens to all the damaged mitochondria? Yeah. Are they still there? <laughs> like, what about the pieces of DNA that, you know, like, is that stuff still there? Like, where does it go? I mean, How does it go yeah. away if it does? The exciting thing is actually the mitochondria seems to also be kind of rejuvenated if, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't really like the term rejuvenated, but it seems to be kind of set back to okay. a better functioning state. Oh, really? And, yeah, again, it's not clear how all these things are linked to each other. I think the other question, though, is, you know, cells also build up kind of these aggregates and other, you know, nasty <laughs> kind of byproducts and accumulate what happens to them. I don't think right. we know that. Um, yeah. But it's an important thing, I think, to figure out. So, I mean, if the epigenetic clock, let's, you know, because it's, you know, controlling gene expression, um, you know, it's like, well, maybe the, my, the nuclear encoded co um, mitochondrial proteins, maybe they're, mm -hmm. You know, maybe everything's just yeah. bouncing back to how it was, and so you're you're yeah. making you know you're building better mitochondria, right? I mean, yeah, I have some I have some colleagues who would argue that it starts with the mitochondria getting rejuvenated, and then that's how everything else. But yeah, I think yeah, we, it's we back need to, to the hallmarks out. of aging. You know, mitochondrial dysfunction is what's one, first. You know? Yeah, I mean, and or as you mentioned, it's probably not just one thing. It's a combination yep. of all these these factors together combined, mm -hmm. where you're. Proteins are misfolding, and your mitochondria are dysfunctioning, and your mm -hmm. you know your DNA damage is accumulating, and so um, uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a fascinating area, and the programming part, like it's just I, I was just curious what your thoughts are in terms of the basic science. Like, what does that yeah. mean to me? It's kind of it, it, it goes back to again that program. Like, there's something yeah. going on we don't quite understand, but it's something. <laughs> yeah, this comes back to this whole idea that. I, I don't think what we see with aging is just random stochastic damage or errors. I think we've always saw, thought of aging as just this accumulation of errors, but it really might just be a program that kind of goes wrong, and there's nothing evolutionarily that needs to prevent it from doing that because it doesn't benefit you know, fitness to prevent that program from going wrong. Um, but the idea that it can be reprogram, again, using the operating system kind of analogy that you can just take an you know, operating system that's not doing well and do an update and take it back to this better state. And again, we need to figure out exactly what that means, but right. I, I think it's really exciting. It is, and it's certainly, like, there's no doubt that accumulation of damage does play a role in aging, but mm -hmm. like, maybe it's not the cause or the only thing yeah. or maybe it's maybe it's just the feed forward loop accelerating it Who yeah, knows, right exactly. I mean, it's it is it's all it's also interesting um, another really interesting area is this the plasma exchange mm -hmm. um, I'd love I'd love like you know to, for you to kind of explain to people yeah. what the what some of this interesting research is in the aging field plasma exchange you can start back to you know the the original parabiosis studies maybe um, yeah. that would be great well, and actually, I think this relates exactly to what you just said, is there is accumulation of damage, and there are, you know, these things that are accumulating in our systems, and it could just be the program responding to that damage in a way that, you know, it was set up to do. Um, so this idea of parabiosis, I mean, this is, what, century, really old. Like, pe <laughs> people were doing this in, like, the early 20th century. Um, or basically, you can take two mice and connect their circulatory systems. Um, it's not a pleasant procedure if you're one of the mice, but they'll do what's called heterochronic, where they take one young mouse and one old mouse and connect them and then just say, what happens to the aging? And the young mouse that, you know, is now having some influence from the old mouse and vice versa. Um, and what we find is that the young mice has accelerated aging compared to one that's paired with another young mouse, and the old mouse is somewhat rejuvenated compared to an old mouse compared to an old mouse. Um, and then more recently, people said, okay, well, maybe you don't have to connect them. You can just do this, this whole plasma exchange method where you can put young plasma into an old mouse, and it seems to, in some ways, again, rejuvenate them, not to use that kind of snake oily term, but that's the best we have. Um, and actually, we've been doing this uh, with cells in a dish. So we can, we actually buy old or serum from older individuals versus younger individuals, and we can grow our cells in these two different conditions. And we, again, can age even fetal cells using old uh, serum versus the young serum seems to be not as problematic. Very interesting. Yeah. 
I know some of the, the recent work out of uh, Rena Convoy's lab at yep. UC Berkeley. What was interesting to me about her, her, her research or her recent research was that um, they were able to take this plasma and, um, you know, basically it was just they, they saline and albumin, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, and exactly. then they, they took old mice and, like, it was essentially diluting out their old plasma. Yeah. And it rejuvenated these mice, whereas they did it with the young mice and there's really no effect. Yeah. So it really indicates that, like, there is, as you mentioned, there's something accumulating, at least in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. with age that may in some way be accelerating the aging process. So um, what do you think the epigenetic age would do, um, like if that was measured? Yeah. Is that gonna be measured? Was it? Yeah. Like so actually, so this is what we're doing in this cell. So actually, the convoys were the first ones who do, did this in vitro experiment as well, so that's how we knew that it would work. And now we're looking at the epigenetics of those cells and also the RNA-seq. And people have started to do this too in terms of the mice um, I don't know if they've done it in terms of the just saline albumin exchange, but in the normal kind of parabiosis context, it does change the epigenetic clock. And so the question, again, is, is, the, is the methylation patterns that we're capturing in the clocks just a response to the accumulation of these kind of problematic factors? Um, because people always wondered, oh, is there something magical in young blood that's rejuvenating versus is it just this problematic things that accumulate in old blood? And it seems to be more of that. Um, and yeah, the idea that you can just dilute it out and, and get the whole program kind of responds and rejuvenates itself, I think is really amazing. So I guess the main questions would be, um, you know, at least if I remember from the Convoy study, um, like, like even the brain, like I think it was the hypothalamus or something. It was mm -hmm. sort of. It was. I don't know how significant it was in terms of like they're they were measuring whatever home, whatever biomarkers they were measuring for marking yeah. aging. It seemed to be better in yeah. the brain. Um, the question would be for the epigenetics is like, well, is it again one of those things where like with the with the cancer chemotherapy experiment mm -hmm. where there's just inflammation, there's something causing damage, and it's a transient thing. Mm -hmm. uh, like then you have to keep getting these plasma exchanges, you know, which isn't yeah. Like, sustainable really um i don't know at least i think it is i don't but yeah. um you know or or is there something that does like does it long-term affect the other organs and stuff like is it something yeah. that's going to be a permanent thing you know i mean i think we don't know i, I we actually I, i'm stealing this from my husband so i'll give him credit for it he he talks about um it's it's kind of environment the like climate change in the body right so the cells are in a problematic climate and they're going to not behave the way that, you know, they should be. And then if you remove that, you know, everything kind of gets better. But if it's not sustained, how quickly is it going to return? And I think we don't know that. I, my guess is it would be about as transient as kind of the effect in, you know, if you could dilute and that's maintained for a while, it would probably be maintained in terms of the cells kind of features and epigenetic measures, but yeah, if it returned really quickly, then I think it would be more transient and 